that, that, that part of what the vision of Black Future in some ways is about, and, and I think Senra, who I think is next, yes, probably demonstrated that more than anybody else, is this idea that part of what the future is, is it going back. You know, that, um, that there's something that we lost, there's something that we're trying to regain, some of that is about Africa, some of that is about, um, about more than that. Right? Some of it's about a kind of a spirit and a kind of an energy and a kind of a joy um, that, um, that we need to regain. So, so what I always find interesting about pictures of the black future is that, um, is that they almost always have some kind of Egyptian thing happening. You know, they always, almost always have some kind of West African sim, you know, imagery, like even the Matrix thing. The Matrix <coughs> imagery was really African, right? Um, the music, even the sweating, right? It was it felt real like like all of your imagery of of what you what you have been brought up to think about what Africa is in, in the imagination, right? And there's a way in which that stuff comes together. So um, so let me just get a little academic for like two slides, and then I'm going to read you a children's story, and then we're going to talk. Right. So uh, one of the things that um, that we talk a lot about when we talk about communications and communications about race and communications about about you know about blackness in many ways, which is caught up in this, is that a lot of times when people talk about the imagery, they get caught at the level of imagery, like okay, this is this image, this image is racist, or this image is great, and um, and we're not necessarily looking at the history and the context that is that is that roots the imagery, okay? Because how we understand a thing has everything to do with how we're socialized and how we're educated to believe what the thing means. Mm -hmm. right, so in every idea, in every moment, there are layers. So you have the, the thing that you're looking at, you have the context in the, in the way you're looking at it. So that picture from The Matrix, that movie from The Matrix would look one way to us now and another way to us in the 50s, mm -hmm. right? You know. Because um, you had people who would just be like, who would have a fight with you if you called them black. That, that would be like something they would want to beat you up over, right? But that, like, that doesn't happen now, hopefully. Well, maybe somewhere, but not in many places I know. You know, but, but you know, so it's like context changes things. And then related to that, right, the next layer is what do we believe? What's the history? How do we understand it? Right. What, what, what does it say about what we believe about who we are, what the aesthetic is, what's important? And all of that at the foundations are the power relations, right? Who gets to determine it? So we go to school. Now then this takes me to the next slide, right? So we go to school and we learn these things, right? So we learn things about what, you know, that, like, that color is what race is, as if that's what race is, right? Or, you know, that blackness is, is all about, you know, pigmentation as opposed to it being socially constructed. You know, I have two brothers who look white. And when I say look white, I don't mean light-skinned in. I mean they look white. They have completely straight hair, com you know, no melanin. And there's no way you know unless they reveal themselves. I have one of my brothers is always walking around. It's like that CB4 line, you know, I'm black, y'all, I'm black, y'all. So you would like want to have a sign. You want to put right, you did all that, right? And then I have another brother who is actually, my brother who is like with the sign, basically, is, is 40. I have a brother who's in his 20s who's passing. He's passing, right? It's like some people don't even know what that means. It's like so, I'm so old, right? Is that basically, he operates as a white man in the world. And he's in his 20s. And you think a person in his 20s would feel freer to construct himself, right? It, you know, maybe even between races. But he basically operates as a white person. And we send him to communicate across the lines. Like, he basically, his, his wife knows that he has black family, but she's never met us. Hmm. He has, like, escaped over the, over the edge, right? Wow. And it's so interesting to me. It's like an interesting thing. We have we have different mothers, obviously, mm -hmm. um, but the same father. And and what's so interesting to me about this 
his, you know, about watching me, my two brothers construct themselves and how they operate and how they live, right? Is that it, it, among other things, it says, you know, race is a social construction. It, you know, you can say it's about blood. You can say it's about this. So this idea of people being colorblind, it's like, what does that really mean? When it's, when, and then you think, well, if you shift it and if we move out of that frame, what we're really talking about is, you know, the political notion for us is more about, it's really about being privileged one, right? Because there isn't anybody who doesn't notice who people are, right? It's like, you know, anyone who says to me, I don't see race, they are lying. Mm -hmm. You know, they're lying. They will be the first person to be like, well, who robbed the store? Well, you know, it was <laughs> first it was. It was about 6'3", it was black, right? <laughs> but there are other ways in which these things are constructed, right? We talk about historically black college, college and university. We never say historically white. Mm -hmm. We never do, even though they are, right? And, and if we did, how would that shift the story? You know, if you said, I went to Harvard, a historically white university, how would that change it? And what would that mean about what Harvard would have to do to shift and change, to be a historically, you know, inclusive university? But more importantly about how these things are structured and, and what gets embedded in our, in our psyche about the black future and about black life and about black possibility has a lot to do with how we understand history, right? And a big part of that is about, about the fact that, you know, we are taught that history is essentially a series of wars. <laughs> and that um, the people who win are good people and the people who lose are bad people. No matter what they do, unless it's the Holocaust. I think that's probably one of the few examples of where people were victimized, where <coughs> folks can step back and say, okay, you know what, um, that was bad. No matter but slavery, there's still a debate on whether that was good or bad, which is kind of interesting, right? Mm -hmm. And in fact, we don't even refer to the people who were slaves, you know, we don't, they're not people, they're just slaves, they're not even human beings, right? So we don't talk about them as enslaved human beings. We talk about them as just slaves, which is different, right? Um, and, in, and even the way we understand the way history happens in the U.S. and the whole conquering of the indigenous people. It's just the fact that we learn history from east to west and to the west to east mm -hmm. has everything to do with that, right? So, that, so those frames become really embedded. And so the idea of sort of imagining ourselves free um, is hard because one, um, who's worthy of being free? I mean, you know, these people came and they had better guns. And, but that's the story, right? They had better guns and they were smarter. And, um, and so that's how you know whether people are smart or not, because they can kill you, right? That's not barbaric, that's not, which I would think would be barbaric and awful, right? That, that that's how you would get, get, get your wealth, that you killed a whole bunch of people, but no, that's considered heroic. That's how we learn it, right? A manifest destiny, all these other really strange ideas that are really just inhumane and violent and awful. And so there's only one way you can in incorporate and internalize that in your life, you know, it, to, for that, if you accept that to be logical, then the only thing you can accept is that the people who it's done to aren't human. Right? Mm -hmm. And so then that makes the idea of the black future hard to hold. Because who's worthy or deserving, right? It can't be the people who just let themselves be enslaved. Like, you know, how could, how could that be? And you don't even learn about rebellion in school. You know, most of the stuff we learned about all that, somebody handed you a book or you went to some black history thing or, or, or some, some cool person in dreads, you know, <laughs> steered you the right way. They were just like your little guardian, right? <laughs> like, you know what, I'm going to wake you up, my brother, my sister, right? And then you end up in the meeting and you're like, oh my God, I didn't know this, right? Someone hand you that book. But the thing that to me is really interesting, um, and this is, I put this up so you guys can see. Look, how many people have seen this children's book before? Have you seen this before? Now, what's interesting to me about this book is the, the brother who wrote this book wrote a whole lot of children's books, most of whom are very, most of which are very famous. This is the only unfamous one out of the, out of the many he rewrote. Willie's Not the Hugging Kind, which was, is a very famous book on reading rainbow and this book is never on reading rainbow if you 